continued from the Cassian playlist. Things were not going well for Cassian today, as he moved with care in the lightly wooded edges of the forest surrounding the cave he had landed his transport in. The scanner dishes on his armor's shoulder swept upward to ensure the starfighters that attacked him weren't making any further sweeps of the area at the moment. His attackers were professionals, and they had been searching the general region for almost six hours at this point, and had nearly caught him out in the open at least once. Even with his armor's stealth features, he did not dare risk a direct scan from Starship-level sensor systems, which he had a feeling might be too much even for his suit, despite the challenges in the current setting. A few moments later, the skies being clear for the time being, he began to cross the open area back to the cave. His armor's extra limbs carrying wood, scavenged berries and fruits, and a large carcass of a local deer variant. Not that he was in any true need for these goods, but he was unsure how long his stay on this island would be and needed to make a sweep of the local area to assess what threat he might be facing while he stayed on the island. His transport was mostly whole and relatively functional after the attack. Chris Tech repair modules are incredible in their effect. However, even they can be overloaded and fried out under enough damage, and a wing of Starfighter sure packed the required punch. As a result, several patches of the hull looked like craters, where the remaining repair systems had reconfigured the remaining mass to seal off the destroyed area. Several other systems had also been fried out due to both the general overload and the fact that to evade his attackers, he had feigned being shot down. Knowing he had to sell it if his pursuers were to believe it, and needing to put as much room as possible between him and the sensors of the attacking craft, he had crashed into the sea at a sliver below the maximum stress ratings of the vessel. It was a craft made by the Dragwa, and they built things to endure extreme handling. And as such, it may have groaned and shook, but an hour later, Cassian was skimming out of the water low to the ground and then the treetops to land into this cave. By his accounting, he could stay as long as a month before risking the ship's fuel being drained by needing to produce food and water. If he could forage as easily as he just had, that could be a few months. A sudden slight tingle in his mind told him another sensor sweep of the island was just passing but he knew the signals coming back would be unclear, just as they had been for him when he saw this island on his way down. Something about this place baffled sensors, not to the point of being unusable, but it had caused distortions, like a pair of grimy, slightly out of focus binoculars. If he had not visually seen this cave, Cassian would not have a clue it was even here. Between the waterfall overhang feeding into the stream that led into the forest and the recessed nature of the entrance, you could only see it from a particular angle. Indeed, it was an incredible stroke of luck he had noticed it in the mayhem of simulating a fatal crash into the sea. The wildlife on the island seemed larger and more combative than seemed proper or natural, but there were hundreds of uncharted islands like this across Jamamar, and any one of them could have been the former holding of a powerful wizard or mage. So, such wildlife could be perfectly reasonable for the environment's less than natural hazard. The issue was, Cassian had not seen such hazards, and was unable to establish a connection anywhere outside the island with his transport's comm system so we had no way to try to check if there were any records of this place, or of calling for assistance for that matter. Farmhold knew he was in transit, 
and was scheduled to arrive in Avalyn in about three days. So it would be then that they would get the first clue that something might be amiss. Three days at the very least. Not a real challenge. Unfortunately, the distortions made it impossible for him to know much more than when a scan was passing over. So he would not be sure if the attackers had left or if they'd called in backup to search the area in further detail. Starship level equipment would likely be able to track him to an island. Then it would become a game of hide and seek. His hope was for the attackers to have bought his crash into the sea, but a lack of wreckage and their sensors likely able to scan deeper into the sea than he had managed to dive. It was clear that they had only been temporarily fooled. Katzian had noted at least four islands in the general region during his descent, and if his attackers made the logical assumption that he had landed on one of those islands, it would only take a few hours to get boots on the ground and start sweeping each one. Unless they had a sizable task force, it would need to be an island by island search. A few days would be all that was needed for the alarm to be raised at Farmhold, and accessing the transport's remote log, they'd have almost up to the moment of the attack as far as where his location was. The loss of the location data auto-updating by itself wouldn't raise alarm, as there were a vast number of reasons this could happen. But it is where they would start their search once he failed to check in upon arriving in Avalyn. As dusk finally began to fall, the scan seemed to slow to one every quarter to half hour, as opposed to the every five to ten minutes they had been earlier in the day. Cassian, however, was not pleased that they were staying this persistent. It meant that they would likely call in search teams. And if those search teams chose to land without much in the way of fanfare, he would likely have no clue. Beyond, perhaps, a constant scan from various assistant craft in the air. Judging from the attacker's initial skill and poise, Cassian had reasoned it was a veteran unit. He did not recognize the design of the starfighters, so he couldn't be sure who was now hunting him, or why. He figured it had to be at Deeplock's instigation, attempting to take him out in his preparations for the coming battle. They had spent vast amounts so far in their own preparations, so hiring a mercenary team to take Cassian out mid-flight didn't seem all that out of the realms of possibility. He had risked using his suit's shaping powers to build a one-inch thick veneer of rock to close the cave off, leaving a single slit to see out with. This way, he'd likely be able to sleep unmolested by any local wildlife. And as he was preparing to settle down, his heart sank as the telltale whine of landing thrusters drew him to look out the slit and see a hovering troop lander, with about twenty to thirty well-armed mercs deploying out of it. Placing his armored hand over the slit as they conducted a series of scans on the waterfall and his wall, all removing it as the lander lifted off loudly and as Cassian looked back out, he could see that the mercs were placing some sort of high-powered homing beacon or comm unit at their landing site. And by the gesticulation between the various mercs, Cassian surmised that they were having the same comm unit issues he was, and thus they would only have perhaps as long as a quarter-mile range. However, they proceeded to fan out and make their way into the woods in pairs, Obviously, they were familiar with how to operate in such conditions, yet another sign of their level of training and experience. A deep voice lamenting the fate of the men outside caught Cassian completely unawares, and as he spun them to see the source, he was met with a shockingly familiar face from his youngest memories. The man was about 
ten foot tall in his meteor iron robes, and they did much to conceal all but his wide face. His bulk belied his speed and power, and Cassian was in much higher spirits suddenly, if a bit confused. Stone Liak, a Dreisai that had been a friend of Cassian's parents when they still lived on the Isle of the Revered, was staring at Cassian with a bemused look, before gesturing to the weapons that had been drawn as Cassian spun to the surprise arrival. Cassian and Sun Liak traded a few words ensuring that each was who and what they appeared to be, and then Cassian stored his weapons, questioning the Dreisai's presence and how he managed to be here at the precise time required for this meeting. Cassian Leont, your arrival here and in this way was foreseen as was your birth and your rare relationship with the flame. The ancient being began. Just as I did in your youth, I again step in to play my part in Destiny's great flow. He approached and gestured for Cassian to sit down, as there was much to discuss. Tale continues later in entry. By the nine and four, welcome to the library, where today we take a look at perhaps the only race of the realms which is as much a mystery as the strange and secretive Shifting Sentinels, a race born during the wars of Feather and Scale as a result of foul depravity, who became a culture of anything but the mad, monstrous destroyers they were envisioned to be. A race that is kept to itself and save for the rarest of individuals, rarely leaves their birthland. In this entry, we look at the Dreisai. Perceptive patrons, regular visitors, and new guests to the library, I am the recorder, and before we continue with the topic of today's entry, Allow me to ask you to like, share, and ensure you are subscribed to Griffin's Library so you can always have ready access to entries as they release. If you wish to further support the realm and the library, join us at griffinslibrary.locals.com for early access to entries days before the regular release, as well as content that you will find nowhere else such as the full episodes of future Podcasts of the Realm. Full podcast episodes will be available to all free and paying supporters at griffinslibrary.locals.com, while entry previews and others in the works material will exclusively be available to supporters. Other means of support are detailed in the channel's description page. Thank you for your consideration and support of the Realm no matter the form it takes. Now, on to the entry proper. The Dreisai are assumed by most that know of them to be strange, large, robed figures capable of keeping pace with a horse and rider while on foot, wise and seemingly never tiring. There are few that are known to live beyond the shores of the Isle of Revere, their homeland and those that do are often enigmas in the region and communities that they frequent. It should be said that they are known to carry themselves with a quiet confidence and are, as a rule, respectful and patient to others, often lending aid or wisdom to those in need. In their robes, which appear as semi-flexible solid metal, only their face and head is visible when the hood is pulled back with large, flat faces on a head the size of most men's torsos, often with horns of a wicked-looking nature. It would be easy to mistake a Dreisai for one of the many interplanar entities from the more dark realms of concept, such as Hell or the Rolling Lands of Chaos. Paired with a few accounts of one in battle, this mistake 
becomes even easier to make. They are paragon wielders of the blue flame, with reserves of erratic power that seem to outstrip nearly any other. Thus, their abilities in combat are far beyond what their already large form would infer, with waves of power used in concept, with their unique weapon, the Chiki Staff, a telescoping combination pole-axe and spear. This results in the few tales of their combat describing them bringing down trees and objects as wide as they are tall with a single swing, while also being able to restore and return the same tree to standing and mended after the battle. Thus, few are willing to tempt fate by crossing one of these seemingly peace-loving wanderers. What almost none know is that while they're able to do all this while in their robes, those very robes, which are in fact solid metal, made pliant by their power and weigh in at well over a thousand pounds, besides offering a superior level of protection by their mass, also serve to limit the Dreysai to a point as to not create an undue fear of them. A fear that would be hard to refute if one were to see a Dreysai without his robe, let alone in battle. In fact, they stand naturally about 15 foot tall, able to reach 18 to 20 foot tall if they stood straight up, as opposed to their natural bent leg, forward hunched stance. Without their robes, they can easily keep pace with a Precon at a full run, and their combat ability skyrockets free from the weight and dampening enchantment of their robes. Their leathery skins are as tough as dragon hide and tend to be of earth tones, and their hands, some would say claws, have extremely extended long fingers. So long, in fact, that they have difficulty manipulating object size for most others in the realms, even of their own prodigious size. Add to this all a tail made of four smaller prehensile tails coiled together, each often tipped with a hook barb or heavy bony mass, and the chances of mistaking a Dreysai for a demon or a devil become nearly certain. This fearsome form was not an accident, as they are not a natural race, and their story serves as a prime example of the depravity that was reached during the wars of Feather and Scale. It begins with the son of the Analar first star weaver, whose ability to form stars and entire solar systems with his grace an understanding of cosmic forces is matched by his son, Life Spinner, and his knowledge and skill in the matters of biology and life. Life Spinner, early in his studies, invented a device capable of taking a creature apart to the base level and components as a mean of repairing, studying, and restoring them. Intended as a medical device, it was to be one of the greatest mistakes Life Spinner ever made by leaving it behind when he joined the Expedus Feet with his father, Star Weaver. The device was then taken and used as part of several secret facilities as part of the buildup to the wars of Feather and Scale. The first of these facilities was hidden on the Isle of the Revered by the Lord Protector of the Analar at the time. It was here, with dragons that had been captured, and eventually dissidents and other opponents to the war, that all manner of unspeakable experiments were performed, trading pieces and parts between subjects, combining and rearranging bodies, bones, and souls in an effort to create a fighting force to throw at the hated dragons. After an unknown length of time, the result was a collection of creatures that are now known as the Dreysai. Although at this point they were every bit the monsters they appeared, understanding only pain and agony if they did not follow their instructions. 
What effect they would have had on the wars of feather and scale is a matter of speculation, as it is not clear how many grades that were made. The matter was never put to the test, as for reasons unknown to the Dracei at the time, one day, the doors to their holding pens opened, their chains and collars fell away, and each and every one of them heard a voice in their savage minds, a voice colored by an unknown but strangely welcome sensation, empathy. The voice led them not only to their freedom, but across the Isle of the Revered, to the very halls of the Revered. While the High Revered, those first that made up the founders of the organization, as well as its main leadership, had long ago been imprisoned elsewhere for their opposition to the upcoming war, there was still a group that had followed the path of unified strength and wisdom and maintained the Hall of the Revered in anticipation for the High Council's return. They had come across knowledge of the Dracei via unknown means and set to the task of rescuing them and setting a way out for them to become free from the cycle of war and hate that they were born of. To this task, they educated and trained the Dracei in arts of all kinds. They also invented the cheeky staff for them to defend themselves and to help them focus their power, as they had proven to have a vast natural aptitude for the blue flame. This training resulted in the culture that we see in the Dracei today, with most of them actually remembering their time in the temple. The Dracei do not procreate, you see nor do they die of old age or disease. And if slain by a foe or foul circumstances, they will merely be reincarnated, either back in the Temple of the Revered, or if their robes and staff remain mostly whole, wherever they happen to be. Most often they will reform with perhaps a new star to mark the event and occasionally they will reform with a different arrangement of features and personality. But save for the rarest of cases, their memories are untouched by their body's temporary destruction. This means many of their race can recall a time before advancing clearly, before the rain. Even if the Isle of Revered was all but already separated from Damamar at this point, the Dracei were well versed in its history and lore. It appears that either via their revered patrons or some other equally potent force, the Dracei were made aware of the nature and state of Jamamar and how it would be when contact was at last properly reestablished. What other knowledge they may have garnered in this way is a mystery, as so much of their culture and internal interactions are. When the Isle of the Revered was indeed reunited with Jamamar, and a constant crossing point between the two was discovered, the Dracei were cautious in dispatching envoys and explorers to discover the changes that had occurred in the many ages that had passed, and to ensure that things were as they should and needed to be. While most sovereignties were more than welcoming to these long-lost members of the realm, the Dracei were careful not to indebt themselves or form pacts with any party, nor did they reveal the truth of their origins, as they considered this a deep shame, the fact that they are nothing more than a madman's wild creations, forged as instruments of death and elder destruction. The only nation that they have shared this secret with is the race they consider a distant cousin to their own, the Dragwa. This is due to the fact the process that resulted in the Dragwa's creation was but a refined and better tested version of the processes that were used to create the Dracei. The Dragwa of the home city for their part considered the Dracei honored kinsfolk and welcomed them to the home city with fanfare whenever they choose to visit. To the rest of the realms, however, 
The Grey Sire but one of many strange things to come from the Island of the Revered. The island itself is a place of mere mythical status. Only a few people beyond the highest of elites and the divines know the truth of the Grey Sire. And most are happy to keep it that way. Few think the truth of things would actually bring any harm to the Grey Sire. But they honor the Grey Sire's wishes in this as they are in the end victims of a crime beyond the pale. Thus, they are allowed the final say in this as a way to honor the fact that they have never hinted at animosity over their creation, even to the Analar themselves. The Dresai, both on the Isle and beyond, tend to act as wandering helpers of the helpless, and often without ever being seen. Using their blue flame talent and ages of experience to divert disaster or interdict it, before it gets too close to those they are protecting. As such, they are most often seen out in the wilds or along many roads and trails that cross the lands of Zamamar, most often at a campfire with an extra portion or three for any wary travelers that happen to cross paths with them. However, in their homeland, they also act as the teachers and trainers of particularly talented or uniquely gifted erratic children. Sharing their ages of insight into the flame, they are able to help guide those that would otherwise see their talent wasted by conceptual differences or other circumstances. On the Isle of the Revered, few would ever gainsay or counter the words and advice of a Dre Sai in most matters, but none would attempt to think themselves wiser in the matters of the flame. And this is where I will draw this entry on the Dre Sai to a close. Hopefully you have a better understanding of what and who these ancient creatures of power are, and why they are so seldom seen or spoken of. Capable of untold feats of might and power, they chose a path of service and solitude over a path of blood-soaked revenge for the crimes of their creation. They are but one of the many races of Jamamar and her realm, but one that is likely to never gain any great acclaim or political power or reach. Perceptive patrons, regular visitors, and of course, new guests of the library, I want to thank you for your time, attention, and of course, your support of Griffin's Library and the realms of Jamamar. It means the world to me. Thank you. Now, before we return to our tale, and until you make your way back to the library for your next entry of Intro to the Realms, I, as always, have been the recorder. And by the nine and four, be well. Take care of yourselves and each other. Now back to our story. As dawn's light lit the skies above the island, Cassian's transport flew out of the cave. Not that any would have been able to tell. Thonliak had much to tell indeed, and as he wrapped the transport in a field of his power to conceal it from detection from his seat in the main compartment, he was still aptly answering and clarifying things to Cassian as the younger man flew the transport out from the cave and began to scan for signs of the pursuing Merc. As Thonliak had told Cassian, none of the Mercs had survived until dawn. The island had indeed been under the effects of an old set of spells and enchantments with all manners of creature unleashed during the night to slay all intelligent life outside the cave or the complex beneath it. The columns of smoke from crashed starfighters, troop landers, and the aftermath of at least a dozen battles across the island snaked into the still brightening morning skies. Standing like a pillar or monolith of some kind, a destroyer-class spaceship had been crashed into the shallows of the grotto on one side of the island, a monument to the deadliness of such ancient magical works. 
the enchantments would apparently escalate in response to any resistance by feeding and using the souls of the slain, including summoning the greatest of demons and devils to fight off any intruders. And clearly they were of a might to bring down such a potent ship supporting the forces on the ground. The fact that most of the holes in the vessel's hull had the edges curled outward indicated the ship had been boarded, ensuring that if the crash didn't kill all hands aboard, they would not have survived the encounters with the creatures that most likely caused the crash. It was a spiteful and dark series of spells and workings that had been created untold ages ago and was rooted and in effect maintained from the only safe place on the island, the cave and the bunker underneath it. It gave Kathy a no small amount of joy as they ascended clear of any of the interference when the series of explosives he had wired throughout that complex went off in sequence and even at the altitude the transport was now at, the effects of the spell's energies being disrupted and discharged in such a way sent minor shock waves through the craft. No matter what it was intended for originally, such a place could not be allowed to remain. It was too dangerous, and Kathy would not be to blame for leaving such a hazard for some cruise or pleasure ship to find. Soon after, Having made contact with Farmhold and updating them on the situation, he was met on his resumed route by a wing of escort craft sent directly from Avlin. They would ensure he made it to his meeting with no more disruptions. Satisfied in setting the autopilot and confirming the details with his escort, Cathian moved back to the main compartment to continue his discussion with Soliak in earnest. As Cathian and Sonliak reclined in the main compartment, Sonliak looked over the state of Cathian's still seeping wounds, where his limbs had been taken from him. Sonliak had not understood when Cathian had first described what had happened to him, and now that he was seeing the reality of it, Cathian almost recalled his armor in reaction to the utter rage rippling from Sunliak's otherwise placid and outwardly calm form. That rage subsided to a visceral disgust almost as quickly as Sunliak realized Cathian's tensing at the Dreyside's fury. Having finished his examination and Cathian manifesting his armor so he could again be ambulatory, Sonliak's disgust at what had been done to Cathian returned to a boiling rage after being handed a vial of the strange, dark, erratic gel that had led Han and the rest to find him in Crater's Drag. It was, according to Scry Arts contacts, the core component of a series of new drugs that had been hitting the market across the realms, with very dangerous side effects for many. From what he had heard, even the few ounces in the vial were enough for no less than a dozen stims or close to hundreds of doses of the more dangerous substances and concoctions being peddled. Sonliak stated without a doubt that the substance in the vial was the distilled essence of a blue flame wielder's primal pain, despair, and agony. In particular, Cathian. It took a moment for the young man to understand the true reason for Sonliak's rage. Then it hit him like a ton of bricks as he felt phantom echoes of agony in all of his limbs for but a second. They had taken his limbs so they had multiple ways to produce this substance, even if he should be rescued, which meant Whoever still had them would be able to continue to make these deadly poisons, as well as the potent combat stim that seemed to be the only relatively safe product to be created from this foul gel. Sonliak confirmed that Cathian's nature allowed for his dismembered limbs to in fact be used in such a way. But if he were to find and obtain these stolen limbs, Sonliak could restore and reattach them 
restoring Cassian's body. For perhaps the first time since his release and rescue from Crater's Drag, or the signing of that first Earth's binder delaying the war with Deep Lock, Cassian now envisioned a foe beyond the immediate and obvious threat of Deep Lock. They might be behind the Merc that had just attacked, and they were definitely involved in his abduction somehow. But Deep Lock did not have the Blue Flame lore or expertise for anything like this gel, or for processing and distributing it across the realms. There was someone else involved, and Cassian was now very intent on finding out who they were. If you'd like to contribute to the further exploration and explanation of the realms, please consider leaving a comment, a like, and sharing the video around. I read all the comments and make efforts to reply to each. Thank you for helping to grow the channel and know I look forward to each and every one of your comments. Other methods of support can be found in the channel's description. Thank you for watching.